Well, aloha, everybody. Uh, welcome to a, uh, another uh, Think Tech Hawaii show on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This show is uh, sponsored by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So I'm really, really pleased to have our guest today, Dave Molinaro from HCAT, which stands for the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technology. Absolutely. Long one. So Dave, welcome aboard. Good to be back, great to Mitch. You. And Dave's a retired Air Force colonel, full colonel, sir. <laughs> I'm only a measly <laughs> retired Emphasis commander, retired. which is like a three-stripe guy. So anyway, welcome aboard. Thanks, so Dave, man. tell me, uh, what, what, uh, what are you doing at HCAT now? What's the hot topic that you personally are working on? And what, uh, well, what there's a lot of hot topics yeah. at, at HCAT, but uh, I was hired as a project manager. Um, and as you know, HCAT has uh, been involved with hydrogen fuel cell demonstrations. Uh, forever for a long time um, but I was hired back a couple of years ago to start off a project that we're just getting our teeth into right now yeah. which is a renewable energy microgrid right. um, and it's been dubbed Pearl the Pacific Energy Assurance Renewables Lab so um, yeah whole host of different uh, renewable energies on a microgrid that uh, we use to uh, do a bunch of different things for the Hawaii National Guard and ultimately the DOD in the state of Hawaii okay so I understand we have uh, some slides that uh, will help us uh, walk us through this because it's a simple concept, but the actual project itself has uh, got a lot of uh, hooks in it. So we need, we need to help with the slides to make sure we get through it. Absolutely. Okay, so can we have the uh, first slide up, please? So again, uh, Pearl, it's got the Pacific ring to it, but uh, Pacific Energy Assurance and Renewables right. Lab. So. Yeah. Um, the vision of Pearl is really, as the slides identify, it's, it's about providing mission assurance through energy assurance. And one of the former secretaries of the Air Force coined that phrase, and it, it's really stuck. But that is what Pearl ultimately will do. It will allow the Hawaii Air National Guard to conduct its missions uh, through energy assurance. So what's assurance mean? That's kind of like a little you know, military buzzword. We have a lot of civilians watching. This. Well, it's assurance means we can do any operation anytime, anywhere, and under any circumstance. And in this case, it's um, if there is problems with the electric grid or the utility, we'll mm -hmm. still be able to conduct operations in that portion of the campus. Um, this particular area we're talking about encompasses the F-22 fleet at the, with the 154th. So what's an F-22? F-22 is something that flies above the water. I know, Mitch, you're used to stuff that goes below the water, but it's, <laughs> it flies really fast. Yeah, it flies too. really fast and does a lot of cool things. So, yeah. but uh, it's a, an important airplane, and uh, um, the uh, vision for Pearl really came about by providing. We really wanted to provide uh, the ability for the wing to do its job, not only the the military, the active duty mission, but also state, uh, state response to maybe a hurricane or a tsunami as well too. So okay, very good. So yeah. let's uh, back to the slide. So really, the objectives that we laid out have already touched on one is energy assurance and resiliency for the hang. Um, ah, there you go. Hawaii hang. Air National Guard. Okay. Yep. Sorry, we've got a lot of civilians out there, but. Uh, um, the Hawaii Air Guard is a, is a benefactor of this primarily, so but it's a pretty big organization, isn't it? I, mean, it I was surprised. How many members are there in the Hawaii Air National it, Guard? It's been a couple of years since I retired, but back then it was close to 2,500. That's a lot. Yep, and it's the biggest uh, guard wing in the country. Right. Uh, we've got the F-22. We also fly the C-17, uh, KC-135. There's also an Intel squadron. Um, and uh, Air Operations Group, which has done some remarkable work with uh, responding to disaster response uh, throughout the world. So, so it's a really neat organization. So overall, I mean, like how many aircraft are we talking about? A like, lot. <laughs> like several hundred? <laughs> Not several hundred, but there's a full squadrons. Uh, there's, there's a, I believe it's up, up to 20 F-22s right now. I believe uh, eight KC-135s. And, and what about, is a KC-135? That is the air refueling aircraft. Uh, okay. It's Boeing 707 airframe that's been around uh, forever. Forever, but it's a great it's a great airplane. But it provides yeah. a pivotal role and the ability to extend forces throughout the Pacific. So it's an air uh, air refueling gas platform. station. It's a flying gas station. There that's correct. Go. Awesome. Okay, back to the slide. So you really can't get into what a microgrid is until you understand what it is. And of course, yeah. you're military, so there's a definition for everything. Well, this happens to come from the Department of Energy, but 
Um, a microgrid really is an interconnected group of loads, distributed energy generation sources that uh, can act as a single entity. And in this case, what's really important about microgrids is they can uh, connect and disconnect from a, from a utility. So in this case, um, with the micro, with microgrids in general, uh, if there are problems with stability or um, uh, maybe there's a, a cyber attack, God forbid, uh, we should be able to disconnect directly from that grid and operate independently. So right. that's what a microgrid does. So all on its own, totally organic <clears throat> to itself. Totally organic to itself. And what we're doing with the Pearl microgrid is we're going to do this with renewable energy, which is really different. So Hawaii is a perfect state for it. Uh, the Hawaii Air Garden, I'll talk a little bit more about it in later slides, but um, we want to get into some additional renewable energy resources like hydrogen um, for right. storage and production and energy generation, which so isn't kind of primary uh, energy sources? By primary, I mean the, 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 you know, the, the core energy uh, producer that we have at, uh, at the uh, Hickam Air Force Base. So when the F-22s uh, were bedded down in the wing, uh, there was a couple hundred million dollars worth of construction. At that time, there was a vision in the National Guard to say, Let's use renewable energy. So mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of PV out there. In fact, uh, there is a facility that is uh, platinum certified, lead platinum certified. Uh, another building is gold and the rest are silver. So there's about a, uh, at least a megawatt of um, renewable energy capability out there. So is it basically <laughs> all solar? I know, I know you, guys had, you guys yeah. had a project uh, with uh, natural power concepts. We did. For small wind turbines. Obviously, you don't want huge wind turbines at an airbase because pilots will probably fly into them, but little tiny ones uh, sprinkled around, is that, is that also an option or is that? that? That is a source that we're looking at. We'd love to demonstrate that further, but as you mentioned, Natural Power Concepts developed a couple of really unique small wind turbines that were easily deployable. Yeah. Uh, they uh, could fit on a military installation, didn't interfere with the radar signatures right. of anything, and it was a, it was a great test. Could that be part of our adaptation of uh, renewable energy? Yes, definitely right. going to look yeah, more at okay. doing that. But for right now, it's PV. Okay, PV is the one. Yeah. Okay. And we all know PV is getting a lot cheaper. Like uh, I saw, I read an article today. Like they're projecting uh, PV in like the next X years, ten years, get down to one and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Like awesome. That makes hydrogen like a total world killer. Absolutely. And it was, now it's down to like I think. Uh, HECO and their latest uh, power purchase agreements are talking like eight to ten cents a kilowatt hour. So that's like the selling price, not the actual production, production cost. price. So sure. There's a, you know, obviously there's a profit margin built in for the supplier there. So you know, it's really, really getting aggressive. I've heard like in uh, Mexico they're down to about two and a half to three cents a kilowatt hour. So pretty, pretty awe-inspiring. Who would have thought? Would have thought, but yeah. it, and it's encouraging to see that it is getting cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to the slide. So, a quick overview. Again, I came on board a couple of years ago, but um, there was a lot of support from our our Codels. Uh, oh, Senator, sorry. What's a Codel? Congressional delegates, in particular, Senator Schatz, uh, for his support of uh, what was then was the Energy Resiliency Demonstration Project. That's what we our formal name and our cooperative agreement. Um, our main partner is the Air Force Research Lab that we share a cooperative agreement with. And by the way, all the funding for this, for HCAT comes from uh, federal uh, congressional ad money. So it's a really uh, unique program. And um, so just to clarify, HCAT, even though it's like a sub-agency of uh, HTDC, gets zero state funding. That's correct. Well, you guys are pretty awesome. You're a heck of a resource, a heck of a value proposition for the state. We, we are. Um, and again, the genesis of HCAT was back in the early 90s with Senator Inouye, who yeah. saw, had the vision of seeing electric vehicles, electric uh, battery. Yeah. And back then, it was internal combustion hydrogen engines. And yeah, he saw that. the value of that and wanted to be able to facilitate getting funding into the state. So we've yeah. been around for a long time. And uh, we do have several hydrogen fuel cell demonstration projects that are Playline support vehicles, buses, uh, we've got a weapons loader, a tug, yeah. some other stuff. And you're real familiar with that as well, too. And yeah, it's really a, with your projects. A really a front end uh, technology. Yeah. Um, in fact, I've leveraged uh, your bus design for 
three buses that we're deploying uh, on the big island. Yep. So, you know, there's something called non-recurring engineering. In other words, you do the initial design, you don't have to repeat it for every bus. So what we did uh, at HNAI is we leveraged uh, the uh, HCAT uh, investment in the, the first bus. That has a value of about $750,000. That's what I and, understand. Uh, so we saved a ton of money, yeah. a ton of time, even though we're still haven't deployed the bus yet. But, um, you know, by being able to leverage the uh, resources of uh, HCAT. So. And your primary fuel cell partner is who? It's US Hybrid. Really? I think an important fuel cell partner with your efforts as well, too. Yeah, so. exactly. And how long have they been in Hawaii? Oh, uh, US Hybrid's been here for quite some time. I know they want to build a bigger presence. I can't get into the details of what they want to do, but they definitely want to uh, get a bigger presence uh, and, and get some ma more mainstream production going with some of their vehicles. But uh, we're really impressed. I know you're happy with, uh, with the Bosca Darzi yeah. and his company and his team of professionals that have put uh, some really remarkable uh, capabilities together. Uh, they really have, yeah. and they're very responsive. And uh, you know, it's not like you have to wait for the government to make a decision like as a private company, uh, a boss, Gazzari, their founder and president and owner, I mean, he can make an, a decision in about 5.2 microseconds, <laughs> yeah, you know. He's, he's uh, very proactive. And then the rest of us have to catch up to him, <laughs> <laughs> try to keep ahead of him. We'll never be able to keep ahead yeah, that, of him. That's though. definitely that's a boss. Yeah. I, can't, I can't say enough good things about yeah. him. He's a great guy. So. And he's actually, on our buses, he's actually cost-shared. So he's actually, you know, put his own skin in the game. Yeah. For example, I have a a uh, brand new fuel cell that we uh, upgraded one of our buses with, with one of his uh, fuel cells. Um, and he actually covered 50% of the cost. Yeah, that, was, that's a boss and yeah. his passion for what he does, it, uh, it, it, it really is a catalyst for what we right. are trying to accomplish in the military and in the government right. uh, to see his efforts. And I know you're really excited about testing out that new fuel cell. To see oh, how God, it works. I so, hard to wait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So back to the slides and to your project. So let's go with some of these other stakeholders. So you, uh, raising a kid requires a village. I think that's probably a bad analogy, but there are a lot of key stakeholders in what this project is. And uh, the primary for us, again, we've got great uh, support out of uh, Senator Schatz and his staff, but Secretary of the Air Force for Installations and Energy has been the prime driver in moving forward with uh, energy assurance, mission assurance. And um, pop that slide back up. I'd appreciate that. Yep. <laughs> Our portable um, brain here. <laughs> our partners with the Air Force Research Lab, uh, Burns and McDonald's are primary A and E. So They've been who are they? This. Burns and, and McDonald. What's A and E mean? Yeah. Architects and engineers. Okay. They have been involved with the Spiders project, as you know. That is the microgrid that's up at Camp Smith. So they are probably the best in the world. Um, the National Guard Bureau, Navy Facilities Command, and the Air Force uh, Center for Engineering uh, is. Uh, these are all key stakeholders that are actively involved in what we're doing yeah. with the project. So. And what's the reaction to the project so far? Uh, um, there's a lot of support. Yeah. Uh, from private sector loves what we're doing. Uh, working with the government's got its own set of challenges. There's a lot of caution involved. Um, I think you know, being spending your time in the military, there's a, some reluctance in adapting new technologies, and you know, rightfully so. I sure. think applying something as dramatic as even going into a hybrid system or into a battery electric takes a lot of muscle movements because You've got systems that are entrenched in, you know, basically fossil fuels. And our, our main objective objective is to defend the country right now and making a major change in something like a renewable energy technology for energy generation or transportation is a big, big challenge. But we do have a lot of support from the secretary level on down through our chain of command, our chain of command, our, our facilitators with the Air Force Research Lab and the Guard Bureau. So we're, we're excited about it. And well, we have great support out of the state as well, too. Based on that excitement, we're going to take a one or two minute break great. for a quick commercial. So uh, we'll see you in about uh, one or two minutes. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Gwen Harris, the host here at Think Tech Hawaii. 
a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of the supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. We're back. We're live. It's Wednesday afternoon, over the hump day. Over the hump day, almost. So, <laughs> I've got my uh, good friend here, Dave Molinaro from uh, HCAT, who's a project manager, program manager, all sorts of manager. I mean, you're pretty well a one-man band, aren't you? No, I've got a small team, but we do a lot, but I appreciate that. And uh, working with Stan Osterman, Rachel, um, right. uh, Rachel James is awesome. We've got Christina and Susan yeah. running the administrative and contract stuff. We're small but dynamic, and I kind of, it's analogous to, I think, the Wright Brothers Bicycle Factory. I love the fact that we're really agile and can get a lot of stuff done without a lot of bureaucracy, too. Right. So that's, I think, a lot of the fun of what we're doing because we are, with this microgrid, really moving forward with some ideas and concepts that just aren't real common sense to yeah. people, and it's, it's time that we do stuff like that. So. Um, so let's pull up the, uh, the next slide. So what you've got there on the left is a pictorial description of what the microgrid looks like. And that's pretty much the F-22 campus on the left. Um, where we are right now is microgrid zero, which is not depicted on there, but it basically encompasses the whole campus. And that will give us the ability to uh, provide cybersecurity, uh, well, I'd be able to island ourselves from the rest of the what NAPEC. What do you mean by island? Thanks for catching me, Mitch. <laughs> island, the ability to disconnect from a utility and operate independently uh, from the uh, Hawaii Electric or Navy Facilities Command Grid that's on, okay. on Hickam. So, um, Some of the key goals that we're trying to achieve is really, again, you're going to see this over and over again, assurance, resilience, and cybersecurity to the F-22. And let me talk a little bit about cybersecurity. Right. Um, you really don't associate microgrids, at least at on the public level right now, with cybersecurity in the military. It's very, very important. Um, uh, there's cybersecurity is a is a is a big issue, um, as you know. So, God what knows. is cybersecurity? What does that mean? Basically, to defend ourselves from attacks uh, from a hostile. What by infiltrating you through the internet or through the internet through uh, acts of internal sabotage, uh, somebody downloads a malicious virus right. or malware or something, but it's that type of protection. Um, the Air Force and the military is very specific and is spending a lot of time and effort on providing cybersecurity. Sure. In this case with the microgrid, it's a not a computer service so much as it is a uh, SCADA system or um, a system of controls and um, for controlling um, generators, switches, uh, controllers, and gears like that as well, too. So, But there's a level of security that we have to provide, and that's a very complex, very uh, difficult process to go through. But that is one of the goals, to be able to do that. Nobody's done this before for a, cyber for a microgrid to provide cybersecurity. So, again, we're kind of wow. reaching through the boundaries of uh, what hasn't yeah. been done before. So this will be a model for the rest yeah. of the, not just the Absolutely. Air Force, but hopefully the other services will leverage you know your uh, non-recurring engineering here absolutely that so. is a goal thanks for pointing that out mitch um there are microgrids out there i think that are small from a really deployed standpoint nothing to the utility scale that we're doing right now right. um and it is a what we look at is for pearl and it's mentioned in some other slides too is we really want to be able to use this as a model or, or a prototype for other microgrids throughout the dod um I'm also looking at, we also look at the Pearl Microgrid as something a state can utilize as well, too, as, a, right. as we move through that 2045 mandate for renewable energy and sure. production, um, microgrids are going to be the answer. And renewable energy isn't going to be done by, solely by PV or batteries. We're going to have to be able to microgrid. We're also going to have to provide something that we are really, it's near and dear to both of us, is hydrogen. Right. Uh, and hydrogen is an energy storage production capability. So. Right. Um, but okay. This, 
Yeah. So uh, when you say uh, you're at microgrid zero, what, what's that mean zero? Does that mean it doesn't have any renewable energy in it or? This one is, a, there's a lot of PV and we're trying to, there's some tricks of the trade that's I think very proprietary with our A&E firm uh, to really increase the, the renewable uh, PV penetration. Okay. Uh, well into the 70, possibly 80% or higher. So that's, there's a unique control capabilities and some of the technology and design work that they're going to put into it will allow us to really capitalize on the photovoltaics. There's also, there's a battery energy storage system out there that we're yeah. going to apply. Talk to us about that. Well, it's a, it's a battery that's going to provide um, some redundancy if the system goes down. Um, tied into the battery, I need to full disclosure on this, this microgrid, um, when we first designed it, we gave the commitment to the wing commander that we will do no harm and make sure that he has got the capability to conduct missions. So the only way we could theoretically do that or in actuality do that is to provide some diesel generation. Sure. When this grid is completely built out, it will be completely islanded, completely off the grid using renewable energies that are in existence right now mm -hmm. through battery, through hydrogen, and some other technologies that we'd like to develop and put on the microgrid. Um, so, but as you asked, microgrid zero really is what I call the cereal bowl for okay. the rest of the microgrids, and it provides that, um, that, that barrier, if you will, that we can apply. It's the test ground if, when we apply some different renewable energy technologies into some of the different microgrids that we've got developed. So. Well, talk a little bit about the time frame. What, what are the, uh, you know, what, when, are, when are these things going to be coming online and, uh, you know, projected? I mean, sure. I, I never carve yeah. my timelines in stone <laughs> yeah. because I haven't missed, I haven't met one yet. But Yeah, that's interesting. But what's your best guess of, like, how, you know, how long is this going to gestate? Great, great question. So the plan is for 14 months for the first microgrid. Uh, in that time. From now. From now. Actually, okay. we're very close to signing the contract. Um, we're shooting for a one May start date, and uh, between long lead purchase, additional design work we've got to do, and getting everything in the ground, we're looking at about 14 months for that first grid, and then there'll be some operations and testing that we'll have to do as well too. And I think we're probably going to cover that in some of the other later slides we've got to. Oh, okay, but... fine. Okay, so let's go to the next slide okay. then. And cover there we are. Yeah. Wow, so start. where are we now is basically <laughs> again as I mentioned we're very close to signing the contract. We're excited about that. 14 month construction design. Um, so I have a question. Go ahead. Like, what kind of equipment are are you having to buy? Like, is it, this is not just existing equipment we have. I mean, what are you going to? A lot what, of this is commercial at? off the self technology to a point, but it's yeah. designed specifically for what we're trying to do. So the battery, uh, battery company will, will shall be named nameless for right sure. now. Um, but there's a power distribution center associated with it. Okay. Uh, again, we've got to buy a, a generator to again provide that emergency backup support okay. uh, until a battery can kick in. Um, and uh, um, so there is some unique capabilities to it. Where it gets challenging is the programming and the controllers sure, that's always and some the of the switch part. gear as well too. Yeah. Um, there's some operations and training that we'll have to go through mm -hmm. and uh, what I've said all along is we have some very smart people uh, that are working the technology. To me the biggest challenge is the implementation of the policy mm -hmm. and um, so what, the what do you mean by policy? Forward. Well, this is again untested. Yeah, I got that. Uh, and again, we're dealing with a military environment. How do you adapt this? How do you, what rules and requirements and regulations are going to have to be uh, adapted? How is this going to get paid for? Obviously, there's a, you know, there's a pretty substantial infrastructure that's going to have to be maintained. Mm -hmm. uh, people have to be trained on it. The cybersecurity aspect of it has to be monitored, maintained on a regular basis. Right. Um, and the Air Force and the military is really not there yet. So that's what this prototype is there for not only from a design perspective, but also from implementation and adaptation. As you mentioned earlier, Mitch, will the military adapt this and move forward? That's the plan. We'd like to see this move forward. Maybe not the exact design, but the concept of it. Yeah. So I got to uh, focus on the operations and maintenance, particularly the maintenance part. Sure. Because that's, I mean, we're in a very aggressive salt air environment. Yeah. Like I have my hydrogen station on the, at the Marine Corps base, and the people from Toyota came and looked at it, and they couldn't believe like the level of, you know, corrosion and everything else that was going on. And, you know, I work on that full time, all the time, painting, chipping, greasing, the whole nine yards. 
And, you know, PV panels don't just sit yeah. there and are benign. You know, like if we don't get it right, they're going to start rotting. You're going to start getting fires and all that kind of stuff. So talk a little bit about the maintenance side. Absolutely no maintenance at all. Okay, no. cool. Yeah, Just no. repair by replacement, right? <laughs> yeah. um, there, is, there is a lot of con corrosion out there, and uh, that's a good point. And again, that's something we have to, to figure out how we're going to maintain and, yeah. and manage a system like that. This is an R&D project. We just don't know. You try to mitigate that by um, designing switch gear that can be submerged underwater if there's a flood. Uh, how do you reinforce some of the PV panels? Uh, I'll give you a good example. A PV that's out at Hickam right now is uh, very heavily um, and, and deeply ensconced into the concrete. Yeah, and I've can withstand, I think, I think, category three or four hurricanes. So, I mean, they're designed to take a big blast, but um, there is an element of, we don't know how things are going to react in, right. in an environment like that. Yeah. Technologies not that all new, but how we're applying it in a military environment is what's different. Yeah, the Toyota guys made a big uh, um, uh, a shout out or, or, or a comment that like most cities are near an ocean. When you look at it, the world map, and so they, they all have some degree of salt water corrosion. I mean, the hotter you are, the more it is. The colder you are, it falls a little bit more benign. Sure. So. So what you're doing here is like uh, setting a standard for the rest of the military, the Department of Defense, and our mainland, and the mainland. Absolutely. And so, like you said, the state of Hawaii, for example. We want to be resilient. We're going to have to invest in it. Yes, absolutely. So that takes money. I mean, you can't just talk the talk. At some point, you've got to put in the dollars and walk the talk. I've seen, I can't tell you the number of reports that I've read or talked to people that are in the private sector, government sector, and they're saying the same thing. We have got to deploy this. As you know, Mitch, hydrogen fuel cell technology, microgrids, uh, generations, switches, you name it. This isn't, again, really uh, novel, but it's how we're applying it's different. Okay. But get it out in the military environment because military has got some stringent requirements. We've yep. um, got to be able to deploy it and operate it in basically no-notice operations. And it's got to work the first time. It's got to work the first time. The cost of it, uh, of it failing could be yeah. mission failure. So we have one slide, I think, left. Yep. Uh, let's talk hydrogen, the hydrogen okay. slide, my favorite one. I think, I think that that's might be towards the one. back, yep. No, I think it's the next one right there. Why there hydrogen? You go. Why hydrogen? Okay. Um, there <laughs> is a there. great, we love hydrogen, and in fact, HCAT has been involved with hydrogen demonstration projects, as you know. Uh, and Mitch, we're really excited to see what HNEI and how your systems are going to operate, and we, right. we know they're going to be flawless. But um, from the military standpoint, we think hydrogen is a great energy storage system, uh, right. more so than what we think with um, uh, traditional battery energy storage systems. Um, Hawaii in particular, uh, in a military installation, we're very susceptible to power outages. I mean, we're not connected to inner island, we're not connected to the mainland. If there's a power outage, uh, we're basically on our own. In fact, uh, uh, there was a base in Europe that was a military air force base that was, um, was shut down because they decided to cut off power. So the ability to microgrid and have a power capability is important. We see hydrogen as a safe, renewable energy. Uh, hydrogen's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's got... Um, uh, so, so many sources. It's, yeah. it's literally uh, yeah. uh, sources everywhere, and nobody controls it. There's no strategic metals or resources that right. are tied to it, unlike batteries that we see, where you've got strategic resources, uh, strategic metals that uh, we may not have control over and are limited in quantity. So, yeah. And you can store energy at the gigawatt hour at level. At the gigawatt It's like scale. a monster hydro yeah. dam. Absolutely. I mean, and people don't quite visualize that yet, but they're going to get the buzz pretty soon. We will, and that's we're excited about being able to do that. Our vision for Pearl is to have a deployed like system yeah. that we can actually use to generate a baseload energy source. So when we look at hydrogen as a, as a plus to do that, Great. it reduces greenhouse gases. There's, a, um, again, the safety factor involved. You, you, you're, you're not, there's a, certainly a, a cost. If you can generate power on a, from a facility or, or near your deployed operating base, you're not spending billions of dollars. And by the way, the, the DOD spends more money on energy than any other branch of the government, yeah, right. I think, combined. Um, if we can generate hydrogen in a location, instead of having it shipped in by barrel or flown in or transported in, um, there's an economic savings to that. And look at all the uh, soldiers that get killed. Absolutely. Trying to protect yeah. 
fueling convoys. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. You know? <clears throat> that is absolutely, um, that is a very personal issue with me on having uh, sent troops and deployed into environment where they were transporting, yeah. you know, literally uh, bomb loads full of fuel and transporting them out in the desert. And, and I, we should be doing hydrogen because we can. Yes. And let's get out in front of this. Let's get, get after out in front it. of this train now. Yeah, totally. Well, guess what? <laughs> we're out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have to do carry on with this conversation at a future one. David, thanks so much. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, thanks for having Colonel. me on the show. Yeah, <laughs> great it's having a pleasure. you here. So that's it for uh, today, and uh, we'll be seeing you uh, next Wednesday. So thank you from Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Aloha.